Hello everyone. This week I'm going to be speaking uh, on Romans chapter 12 again, the passage that carries on directly from the reading uh, of last week. Romans chapter 12 is a pivotal point in the book. The first 11 chapters, there's been much teaching about the human situation, the struggle with sin, God's judgment, God's grace, the power of the cross of Jesus. And all this teaching builds up to this pivotal, pivotal point, which is marked with the word, therefore. Therefore, because of all this, we, we should live and be like this. And so we have the teaching that comes, the application teaching that comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and onwards. The chapter starts with these words, which I spoke about last week. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then the verses, the next few verses, are the ones I spoke about last week. And we pick up this week at verse 9. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Sincerity here comes not from feelings. I, I feel my love is sincere, therefore it is. Sincerity comes from our obedience to love, whatever we feel like. The verse continues, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Where our minds dwell has a huge effect on what our actions are and what we are like. Where we allow our mind and our thoughts to dwell has a huge practical outworking in our life. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In other words, cling to what is good, as our reading says this morning. Yet, we can be instinctively drawn the other way to what is bad, the things we don't like, the things we disagree with. We can be drawn to criticism or judgmentalism. Our minds so easily dwell in these areas. I've used an illustration before that goes like this, and it's, it still sadly can be true. I might go to a church service somewhere else, and afterwards in conversation with Jenny or someone else, I will say, oh, it was a really great service, except for that hymn, or except for this. So I've said the handful of words in just a couple of seconds, it was a really good service, except for, and then I will talk terminally about the one thing or I didn't like or didn't agree with. This hymn or this worship song was really awful. It's a great service, but then I will start talking and dwelling on the one thing I didn't like. Cling to what is good. I've preached about this before, but after years, I still have to check myself from time to time. Cling to what is good. Verse 10 and 11, be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. So we're exhorted in these verses to zeal and to fervour in serving the Lord. So rhetorical question, how is your zeal and fervour this morning? Are you fired with zeal and fervour for serving the Lord? Or are you thinking, steady on, let's keep all this a bit more Anglican, Church of England. I'm sure you're not thinking that. But the language Paul uses here could be heard as a language of fanaticism. It could be. Fanaticism. I've had, a, I've had an interesting time looking up various definitions offered for fanaticism. But this one will do. Fanatical. Filled with an excessive single-minded zeal. Yep, I reckon that's what Paul is talking about here. The fanaticism 
of love, self-giving love, the love we see in Jesus. So at the end of this sermon, I'm going to pray that we're going to become a church of fanatics. And I hope you'll add your amen to that prayer. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So first, joyful in hope, the joy of the Lord in what is ahead, the promises of God give joy. Joyful in hope, pay, patient in affliction. Now, affliction here isn't specifically persecution. Just feel I need to say that because some Christians believe that affliction is a symptom of a lack of faith in a Christian. Now, if you believe that, you're going to struggle in obedience to this verse when you hit difficult times, which we all do. Now, I'm not saying we should be passive in the face of affliction. We should pray and seek God's salvation, deliverance from whatever the affliction is, for sure. But in his time, not ours. Patience in affliction. Faithful in prayer. Keep going in good times and in bad. Be a dogged, persistent prayer. Faithful in prayer. Verse 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. There's a particular responsibility that we have to our brothers and sisters in the church, in the body of Christ. Sorry, it's going to go again. Generosity is never out of place, never. But it's particularly commanded amongst believers, amongst the brothers and sisters. So that's verse 13. Verses 14 to 16, uh, there are further instructions on Christian living and attitudes and actions. But I want to, this morning, shoot straight on to the last section of our reading, verses 17 to 20. Now, to understand this section, it's essential to hear clearly how Paul starts and concludes the point he's making. Otherwise, this bit, this, these verses are very easily misunderstood. So the section starts at verse 17 with this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And concludes at verse 21 with do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And in between those uh, verses, uh, it deals with living at peace with people, even our enemies. Verse 20 may have st stood out as you heard it read earlier. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. What do you make of that? Do this good stuff to him and you'll be heaping burning coals on their head. Is this about being nice to your enemies so they will suffer the burning coals? Serves them right. After all, verse 19 of our reading today says, uh, God says, it's mine to avenge. So bring on the burning coals. Is that what this is saying? No, it's not. We need to interpret this verse in a way that is consistent with Paul's main point of this little section. To remind you, verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. You know, the sort of thought that would say, bring on the coals for being my enemy. No, not evil for evil. And do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The key to understanding this passage is in the symbolism of burning coals. They're not, in this context, just very hot things put on the head of one's enemies to make them suffer. The burning coals are not to perpetuate evil, but to overcome it. Paul, in this verse, is citing 
Proverbs in the Old Testament, Proverbs 25 verse 21 says this, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. It concludes with those words, the Lord will reward you, as if it's speaking of an act of human kindness. Behind this proverb and the passage from Romans, uh, some commentators see an ancient Egyptian custom of a penitent person holding a plate of live coals over their head. But in scripture, we can look to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, to get insight. Let me read that to you. It's about the call of the prophet Isaiah. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Cleansing, purifying symbolism of the burning coal. Malachi chapter 3 speaks of the refining fire that separates out sin and evil. It's not that doing good to an enemy, just by doing good to an enemy, they're automatically forgiven. But they might be brought to the place of forgiveness, the place of cleansing and refining. So in conclusion, verse 9, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, even when our instincts tend to make us focus on things that aren't good, choose to focus on the good. God's purpose is for our character to reflect the character of Jesus, never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour in serving the Lord, radical love, fanatical love, in the world's eyes. We're called to be those who see good and focus on it, those who want good, even to those who would be our enemies. And you know, this doesn't come naturally, but it does come supernaturally. As we choose obedience, that's our part, choose to do the right thing, the Holy Spirit enables and empowers. That's the promise of God, enables and empowers us to be and do what we could not be or do without him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, give us love that's sincere. Enable us to hate what is evil and to cling to what is good, even when our instincts sometimes lead us to focus on what we don't like, what we disagree with, things that are bad. Father, enable us to allow our minds to dwell and cling to what is good. And Father, we pray that by your Spirit, you would make us ze zealous and give us a fervour in our faith serving the Lord even to be fanatics for him, Lord. A bit of fanaticism could go a long way in our church. We ask for that in these terms, Father. Make us patient, prayerful and generous in accordance with this word to us this morning and want good even to our enemies. We pray all this in Jesus' name and for his glory in our lives and in his church. Amen.